Thank you. Thank you, Cosmin, uh, Chinyi, and Parasite for this um, very generous invitation to be modest with a very immodest goal. So the treacherous terrains of my talk today uh, are really spelled out by these, uh, this, this ensemble of hard to define words. Um, uh, and, and that sort of gives it the title of my talk. And I'm going to try and navigate through this, um, through the, an idea of a, of a 10th century polymath called Al-Biruni, and what he referred to uh, as an idea of egocentric maps. So imaginary maps that, uh, that place oneself in the center and then move as one moves. So sort of Google Maps uh, as an idea imagined a millennium ago in what is now Uzbekistan. The nodes for my maps um, are my own sort of curatorial and research projects that I've been involved with uh, over the uh, past few years. Um, and a few live questions uh, that my colleagues and I at the Asiad Archive are trying to grapple with as we respond to the, uh, the exigencies um, of our particular time and place. You'll forgive me for clinging to uh, the specific and the personal, but I hope you will share my comfort with considerations that emanate from such uh, specificities. But let's, uh, let's start with art. Thank you, Ruth, for that, uh, uh, that title. And let's start with art that looks um, at nation. Uh, much as I applaud uh, Charles's effort to decimate the very notion, um, I, I think it's, uh, rumors of its death are exaggerated. Um, and I want to start with a work uh, by the Irish artist Tom Malloy. It's, uh, it's called Borderline. Um, and it's a, a commercially available globe about yay big. So you can tell I'm a curator. This is not what an art historian does. Um, uh, as, as Ruth, uh, I'm shamelessly ripping off uh, from Ruth's presentation. It's a, a commercially available globe that he has removed everything apart from the man-made lines. Uh, so he's gone over it with acrylic paint, sanded it down over a series of weeks. So what, what, you, what emerges, almost as if it's embedded within, are these lines. And you can already probably glimpse uh, this sort of this density of the lines emanating from what is Africa, uh, South Asia uh, in the center there, um, and, and, and Asia on the side. This work uh, it sort of raises questions for me, and I think for, for many others, as to the manner of creation of these lines. Uh, you're making us ponder over the dissolution of empires in Europe and the messy process of decolonization elsewhere. This work was uh, shown um, as part of a project that I've been working on since, uh, since 2005. And at this incarnation at Cornell last year, I worked with uh, my colleague Iftikhar Dadi, uh, who teaches there. Uh, I'm not going to describe all the works here, but perhaps just uh, point out two or three. The red line that you see is the red line of the Oslo Accord uh, made, uh, made uh, material. And it's a work by a, a group called Decolonizing Architecture. Uh, what you see, the sort of the watchtower, is a new work that was commissioned for the show by the Tunisian artist Nadia Kabilinke. It's, uh, it's airbrush uh, painted on the wall and the floor. And at the far corner, uh, in a way, sort of opening this exhibition, this was one of about six galleries that took over the show, um, is, uh, is what looks like a, a sign uh, from, from the highway that you would have uh, crossed while coming to Cornell and Ithaca. And it says Cayuga Territories. Uh, and I'll talk about the Cayuga a little bit later on. Now, Lines of Control is a project about failure. Uh, so that much we have in common uh, with, with Cosman's introduction to this whole conference. Uh, uh, the, the failure of human beings to live together, the failure of nation states. And if nations are uh, no more than Ben Anderson's imagined communities, then a failure of the human imagination. But in this failure and the partitions that result as its direct consequence, uh, I think also lie the seeds of renewal. 
Lines of Control looks at partitions as a productive space, not in a value judgment sort of, uh, of way, but in a quite literal sense that parti partitions produce. They are where nations are made, uh, they give birth to borders, uh, to, they instigate mechanisms of control, of policing, of identity. They rewrite histories, reconfigure memories, and transform our relations with our partitioned selves. Now, Lines of Control started back in 2005 uh, and as an investigation into the visual aftermath of India's partition in 1947, which displaced about 15 million people, caused between half a million and three million deaths, um, and was sort of one of the, uh, the cataclysmic events of the 20th century, but one which, in my opinion, sort of left a very small visual mark on the world's collective imagination. And this project was, uh, was a way for me to start to grapple with why that was the case, and, and how does one address that? Uh, my entree to this was not biography, um, although, like many people of the subcontinent, uh, this is also part of my story. Um, both my grandmothers uh, came to what is now Pakistan from India, most dramatically in my maternal grandmother's case, with nothing but the clothes she was wearing and the wedding dress uh, that had been made for her. But no, this story too starts with art. Um, I'm not going to talk about Amar's piece again, because Charles has already done that for me. Thank you. Um, but I sort of started getting interested in uh, partition really through the lens of work that was coming out of India, out of artists who were responding uh, in 1992 to the demolition of the Babri Mosque. Uh, this was the sort of the rise of uh, the right-wing BJP party. Um, and I, this specific artist I'd refer to as Nalani Malani there but also uh, a series of others like Amar, uh, like Anita Dube, um, who were taking up the cudgels to defend notions of uh, secular India um, and uh, assert themselves uh, in a manner that the, uh, that the scholar Geeta Kapoor has referred to as citizen artists. And it's a phrase that you may, some of you who were here yesterday, may uh, recall from yesterday's talk of uh, Yung Yang who attempt a transformation in the norms of civil society by making their practice a politically viable proposition. Now, I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. Uh, and it certainly, it, it felt uh, very interesting uh, for me to follow. Now, as um, time has gone on, as you can see, uh, my projects tend not to finish. Uh, forget one-off events, biennials, they're more like perennials. Um, and as the project has moved, I've traveled, um, and so too have the maps in my egocentric mapping. I'm not going to go through all of this, but the things in red are to do with the project, the things in white are what is happening in the world. Uh, and if I was sort of, I'll go back to the Cayuga Nation. So in 2006, um, the Cayuga lost a case in the Supreme Court of the US to get their own territory in New York State. And that now the Cayuga, of course, are a sovereign state uh, within, like many other uh, Native American tribes uh, and peoples. So they, uh, in their manner of thinking, they are sovereign. They have only had treaties with the US government. So therefore, everything has to be negotiated. Uh, so the number of cases still running in, in the U.S. of various Native American people uh, and their negotiation with their sovereignty are an interesting case in point. Um, I'll talk about um, the Bombay attack in 2008, uh, which resulted in the symposium we'd planned for people like Nalini Malini, who was actually born in Karachi but hasn't been since, to, to come over again had to be canceled. Uh, it was just too politically uh, inflammatory to have Indian artists coming over. Uh, you will recognize sort of the, uh, the growing hands of China as I sort of move eastwards. Um, and when I uh, arrived here in Hong Kong, uh, I arrived to uh, you know, the protests uh, around the, the curriculum that were taking place. Very soon after, um, there was the, the map of China that was being printed on the passport 
to which India responded uh, by, by printing their own map uh, with the same region being shown as part of India onto Chinese passports. Uh, so, and, and last but not least, uh, next year marks uh, when Scotland will vote for secession from Great Britain. Let's see how that turns out. Um, and 2015, if uh, the treaties that and, and agreements hold, is where ASEAN, not learning from what's happening to EU, turns itself into an EU. Um, so, you know, while the rhetoric of globalism and the political desire for economic blocks, uh, such as EU and ASEAN, create this fuel for this idea of no nation, uh, in a way what's also referred to in the, in the recent Guggenheim show, at the same time, and with equal force, there are new nations. And these new nations are actually, Scotland, for instance, would it have succeed, seceded if there was not for the EU. There we go. And I want to end in this, this section uh, with a quote from uh, the American historian, uh, Jerry Muller, I mean, you can read what it says up there uh, on its own, but his central proposition is that ethno-nationalism, wherever it raises its ugly head, uh, partition is the least worst option. And he traces uh, th what's happened in Europe through a uh, post-World War scenario, where all the Germans have gone back to Germany, where the Ukrainians are now in the Ukraine, uh, where the Jews have actually swept out of Europe into Israel. So he argues that Europe's peace has, has not been because of uh, uh, sort of uh, that the ethno-national beast has been tamed, rather it has, uh, it has just been contained. So more than 55 nations were formed in the two decades after the end of the first, uh, Second World War. Uh, many of these nations were arbitrary divisions of spoils and influence between clients of empire. Many are held in place by post-colonial tyrants buttressed by real politics uh, in, in the Cold War. But since 43 new nations were carved out between 1966 and 1990, um, I would argue that the Cold War gender was, you know, was anything but cold for most uh, of the regions outside Euro-America. But it's not just force and, and economic dependence that acts as the glue. More narrowly, art, uh, but also culture, sort of more broadly culture, is what constitutes the nation. So nations are cultural constructs. And if we keep that notion in mind um, as, as sort of these cultural constructions, I think it's a useful vantage point from which to ponder internationalism, old and new, and then consider how art and culture is engaged in continually forming, performing, and re-performing the nation. This is, uh, these are some, some Google shots of the actual Waga border ceremony uh, and the sort of the strutting peacocks of people uh, of uh, India and Pakistan uh, performing the, the ceremony to close and open the border. And you can see some of the the audiences. So this is uh, greeted with wild applause every day, and it's a it's a tourist attraction that people go go, go to see. Right. Next, multiculturalism. Let me change continents. Um, as you can possibly tell by by my accent, uh, a little bit it changes where I move. Um, the city that I've lived in most uh, in my life is London. Um, and as luck would have it, uh, the UK is the birthplace of much of the discourse and policy framework uh, for multiculturalism, although multiculturalism, of course, has existed all over the place all the time. But in my egocentric meanderings, I will start with two projects that I was involved with in 2006. Uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with what was happening in 2006 in the UK, uh, this was a year after uh, an event which uh, an unfortunate Americanism has now made popular as 7-7. So these are the July 7, 7 bombings on buses and uh, tubes in London, which resulted in race and faith becoming conflated. 
So brown and bearded was the new black. I'm going to start with um, the first time I ever encountered an archive, uh, which is when the Royal Geographical Society, where many of those lines that you saw on Tom's globe were actually drawn, uh, invited me to uh, respond to their archives in a series of notes. Um, and one of the things that, uh, it's, it's a treasure trove. So, you know, everybody who's been, you know, exploring, traveling the world has basically left them their albums, uh, their notes, their diaries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I was struck in particular, I'm just gonna share a couple of images with you. I was struck in particular uh, by an album by uh, an anonymous person called C.E. Bruce. Um, and uh, in particular by two photos that had the same title. Uh, the title was One Day's Bag. This was the first one. I don't know if this is C.E. Bruce or not. And this is the second one. Now I'm not sure what to make of it uh, as to whether this was his catch and this was the other guy's or they caught this. And, and arranged it for him. But I thought just the juxtaposition is interesting. Um, and then the inner accountant in me got really excited on coming across this table. Um, and what this table does is it summarizes uh, a page in an almanac, and the almanac was about yay thick. Um, and most of that thickness accounted for every little county, every little town, every little shire in what is now Great Britain. But the last sort of 13 pages summarized um, the contribution of, and I think it's territorial positions, possessions under the management of the East India Company. So even in 1812, so this is about 40 years before uh, the crown took over possession, about a third of Great Britain's uh, GDP was being produced, well, mostly by India. Uh, and India, I mean in the sense of what was, of course, what we now think of as British India, so including uh, areas of, of Pakistan, Bangladesh, as we think of them now. And, and if I sort of think about this idea as a claim, so, you know, you have a claim when you've contributed to something, you know, I mean, think about your pension trust. Uh, your pension funds. So, I mean, I sort of think about this as, as uh, you know, there is a claim on what is now called Great Britain from the people of India. Uh, and, uh, and conversely, uh, this idea, I mean, much, much uh, debate was going on in 2006 about what it means to be British, what is Britishness. Um, and prime minister after ex-prime minister was coming up and talking about, you know, warm beer and critic, uh, cricket and freedom. Um, but I had sort of, uh, I, what I, what in this paper I argued was that um, you cannot actually, the problem that the British have with notions of Britishness and British identity is that they don't recognize their Indianness. If you uh, do not recognize that you're at least partly Indian, you cannot be British. You can be English, you can be Scottish, you can be Welsh and, and Irish until you, of course, secede and then, you know, you're something else. Uh, but, you know, to be British, uh, you need to open that identity up. The next project that I'll talk about, and I'll just share two works uh, by two artists, um, was a small show um, I curated for the Whitworth Art Gallery, which is attached to Manchester University. Um, and uh, it was actually accompanying a symposium, uh, not unlike this one, uh, which I um, curated with uh, Amelia Jones, uh, an American art historian who was the head of art history there at the time, which addressed faith and identity in contemporary visual culture and one of whose titles was actually Brown is the New Black. Um, and the show, um, uh, the, uh, let me talk about this work here. This work um, by a young so British artist, Yara Al-Shabini, um, started as a performance where she did a workshop where she invited people to work with her to produce a series of carpet bombs. So, you know, what do you need for a carpet bomb? Of course, prayer rugs, football, 
um, you know, old toilet ro uh, roll used and a, and a little string. Um, but what she, what she found was that people were incredibly reluctant uh, to, to cut uh, the prayer rug. So after trying uh, to hold one or two of these uh, workshops, actually the first one, one Ruth was at the RCA, uh, she gave up and made that into a video. Uh, the video was called The Demonstration, where she then herself uh, produces charming carpet bombs. The second piece uh, that was in that little show uh, is by Shazad Daoud, um, a, uh, somebody who plays with these notions of identities uh, wonderfully well, depending on where he is uh, and what he's showing. Um, he sort of liberally rearranges the, uh, the notions Indian, Pakistani, and British uh, in some combination. Um, and the piece here called The Nation of Islam is uh, again small. This is, it's a knuckle duster, uh, so the sort of things that you see on, on gangsters, um, with um, with diamante sort of uh, engraving spelling Allah, and the nation of Islam is a reference uh, to many things, to the nation of Islam itself in the in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so. Uh, as you can read, you know, justice by any means necessary. Uh, it's kind of interesting, this uh, resurgence in notions of justice as a philosophical concept uh, that have become all the rage, uh, and particularly with, the, with the sort of Michael Sandel at Howard. Um, justice has, has been around uh, as a cry for, for a long time. Um, Muhammad Ali was probably the most uh, prominent of uh, the Nation of Islam's uh, followers. Um, and in a way, that sort of Nation of Islam uh, uh, anger or quest for justice morphed uh, into uh, uh, the Black Panther movement. Uh, and the sort of the, the power salute that you see here uh, in the 1968 Mexico games. Um, was, is, is something that's inscribed on a lot of uh, people's memories. And on the corner there is, uh, you've seen some other uh, knuckle dusters. I wanted to move from this particular Black Panther photograph to that of another Black Panther. This man, um, who the art world knows as uh, the founding editor of Third Text, uh, Rashid Arain in his Black Panther outfit vest, um, uh, the first organization he founded was called Black Phoenix, um, was the curator of this exhibition called The Other Story. Now this is one of the many exhibitions that get picked as the, uh, the starting point for you know, contemporary art. Contemporary art and the global beyond 1989. But perhaps it's the one that gets talked about least um, for reasons that perhaps Jean Fisher has argued uh, very well. Uh, I'm not going to add to that. But I want to jump from this exhibition. This, this took place at the Hayward Gallery of the South Bank, so on the south of the Thames River, to an exhibition that took place oh, uh, exactly 23 years later well, last year, called Migrations in, uh, Journeys into British Art at Tate Britain. I'm just going to show you a few slides. Uh, some of the names I'm, 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 I'm guessing are not going to be familiar to, to everybody. Avinash Chandra, Anwar Jalal Shamza, Souza, uh, Aubrey Williams, there's Rashid Arain himself, more Rashid, the sort of the minimalist sculptures, Frank Bowling's wonderful Who's Afraid of Barney Newman, and David Medalla's um, seminal cloud canyons. Uh, you can't really see them there, but this is the work from another photograph. Um, and sort of the influence of work like this on people like Roger Hions, uh, who was shortlisted for the Turner Prize uh, a couple of Turners ago, is sort of, you know, very obvious. 
Um, and then Li Wanchao's monochrome white painting. Sorry, I'm not going to show you. It's just white. It just it, it says what it, it does what it says on the tin. Um, nearly all of these works, in fact, I'm guess I'm, uh, if memory serves, all of these works were shown at the Hayward Gallery show, a show that was panned, uh, critically, uh, largely ignored. Uh, and 23 years later, these guys have made the journey into British art. Uh, and the question it raises for me is, okay, well, what does this mean for art and its histories? Uh, if one can migrate into British art, does it mean that there's an immigration from other places? What does this mean for Philippine art history? What does this mean for India? What does this mean for Pakistan? Um, and I... Yes, I don't, I don't know the, uh, the answers to those questions, and, and I think they're live questions that we as the archive also need to figure out you know, how to deal with. Um, but what it, it struck me is uh, one of the recent, uh, the books that I read uh, recently on coming to Hong Kong was uh, Chen Quan Sing and his sort of plea for the notion of decolonization to work in two registers, not just on the colonized, but also on the colonizers. So is this perhaps a, uh, a, a good example of what that looks like? Uh, and before you sort of um, all sort of cry into your handkerchief at the, at the, at the beautiful emotion of, of that eg example, what's happening at the same time, and Erica sort of described this a little earlier in her practice as, uh, as around what you need to do to get money from the Arts Council, uh, so while this has now been happening at, um, at the institutional level, what's happening at the government level is that in February, uh, the new government of the UK, well, it's no longer so new, conservative-led, has come up with a new curriculum for history. Oh, by the way, the art has been dropped as a core subject. Uh, it's, it's not sort of important enough. And history will go back to... Uh, to sort of fashioning, and let me quote, uh, encouraging pride in the history of this island nation. Uh, the syllabus uses the terms gunboat diplomacy and includes Clive of India um, as one of the heroes of Britain that every school child uh, must sort of you know, now learn about. Uh, Clive of India was, was a thug um, who basically you know, beg bowl and, uh, and stole a lot from what was in India uh, at that time. So what this does to, as a predicament for sort of the, the British identity that I just described a couple of projects ago, I think is an open question. So, multi, so, while, you know, so, so the Tate is welcoming people into British art history and the government is going backward. Um, so I think this is a circle and this goes back to perhaps the, actually the, the most treacherous word in, in this conference title, which is after. Um, I don't think there is after. Uh, I, think, I think we're sort of you know, trapped in various repetitions. So the, the, you know, multiculturalism, post-colonialism, concepts of the nation and their death, um, channeling Mark Twain, I, I think they're all greatly exaggerated. And I suspect this has more to do with a sort of collective frustration and not being able to get anywhere with whatever it is that it means to be a multicultural self. I read this after in that spirit of a, of a sort of mutual boredom uh, on the continued reliance on playing up marginal positionalities of Stuart Hall's West and the rest formulations. A certain wariness of multiculturalism's inability to engender a mutual respect and understanding of one another's arts, art practices, uh, and by extension, of one another. Sort of mere coexistence with tolerance does not seem really like a goal, goal worth trying for. This is the last part of my uh, presentation. Um, and we've talked a lot about failure, and I'm going to continue, because I, I want to start this uh, by admitting my own. I've been wrestling for some time with trying to sort of craft a thread of argument that will start at the bottom and get to the top of the peak that, that Ruth was sort of describing yesterday. But all I seem to be doing is being stuck in a base camp and make little excursions. 
the peak seems remote. What happens to contemporary art after global expansion? I don't know. Uh, but I share this desire to find out. And I hope you will indulge me in sharing some of my excursions um, uh, from this base camp. And perhaps in the plenary session uh, and, and further on, uh, I'll sort of enlist all of you to try and help make that climb. The base camp that I want to start with is uh, the first issue of an online uh, journal that the archive has launched called Field Notes. Um, and uh, it started, um, the first issue was titled The And, an expanded questionnaire on the contemporary, and addressed the notion of the contemporary with specificity to the region. It built on Hal Foster and Terry Smith's questionnaire on the contemporary uh, in, in October uh, journal in uh, 2009, where, where the editors approached about 70 art critics, historians, and curators to address this elusive quality of the contemporary, but in a very curious gesture, only addressed those based in Europe and the US, because they felt that the questions as formulated were specific to those regions. Um, let's, let's just let it rest there. This is my first day at the archive, September 24, 2012. Uh, and I walked into uh, a, a round table which led off from, from that journal. And it was a discussion on trying to locate the contemporary in art history. That, by the way, is the former Black Panther, Rashid Arain. Um, needless to say, as you can probably see by the hands on chins, we couldn't find the contemporary in art history, but it was not for want of looking. Uh, we overturned lots of stones, and I think all of my colleagues will have their own takeaways from this, this workshop. I want to share a few of mine. That the contemporary is not free-floating. It is rooted in time and place. It comes out of somewhere. But then, while the world has programs of, and initiatives for alternative modernities, comparative modernities, surely one needs more effort on the comparative contemporary. Or in fact, why do we even talk of the contemporary and not the contemporaries? I don't know. Now, contemporary, my second sort of takeaway, is that contemporary art is obviously operating on multiple registers. Uh, many people much smarter than I have thought about naming these, these registers, and I, I'll sort of just take refuge in Terry Smith's version to what he's called currents. Uh, and I'll give you these names uh, and then my shorthand abbreviations for what they are. The first is remodernist, retro sensationalist, and spectacularist. So this is the kind of stuff that you'll see next month at Art Basel. Transnational transitionality, a search for criticality and worldliness. This is the kind of stuff that you'll see at the end of that month at Venice. Art with no name, sort of tentative explorations of temporality, place, affiliation, and effect. This is the kind of stuff that you may not see. We just read about or, or hear about at conferences. We heard about some of this stuff yesterday from Jung Yang, a sort of DIY aesthetics. Now, I don't want to get into a detailed discussion in the pros and cons of these, uh, these currents, but would just like to register that, this, that Terry Smith is differentiating in intent and form, but not in modes of circulation. And I would question whether you know, the stuff that you see at Art Basel is that very different to the stuff that you see at Venice in the modes in which it circulates. The third takeaway for me is that there is will, willful scope creep in contemporary art towards becoming what Irit Rogoff has called an undisciplined discipline, one that begs, steals, borrows from you know, anthropology, archeology, span any other ologies that you may wish to chuck at it. The fourth, 
is that um, an appreciation of uh, that the contemporary art's voracious need for validation is being addressed primarily by the market. Those other institutions of validation, the museum and the academy, are still finding their way. Um, Charles has already talked about you know, the Guggenheim's current uh, effort at doing so. Uh, we can talk about that, that more at questions. Um, this is MoMA and their you know, launch at a research platform, for which these are notes on modern and contemporary art around the globe. And, and Goldsmith, uh, sort of the home here at Rockoff herself, and this is a course that she runs, uh, MA Global Art, uh, also offers, uh, this, is a, this just came out, well, two days ago. Uh, so MA in Global Art um, also offers you, and who was it? I think it was Inti who was asking for non-French philosophy. So if you go to MA Global Art, you can actually study philosophy by sub-Saharan African philosophers. So what is it that has become global in art? The market is easy to replicate. Yeah, it's art fairs, biennials, museum collections, academic programs as cultural exports. But what of knowledge production? But more importantly, what of knowledge reception? Who's receiving this knowledge? And what are they, do what are they doing with it? I don't know, but I'm gonna now start my excursions. Excursion number one, on the bus that is called art history. I'm gonna reference a couple of tables here, some juxtapositions. This is one by Ian Robertson, who's actually, um, actually lecturing on the other side of that bridge uh, on a course that Sotheby's is running on global you know, art uh, right now. As we, so he may join us at 5.30. Uh, so, and what he's done is, is look at a particular point in time and looked at the collective, if you like, turnover of artists uh, through, uh, at auction. They're the, you know, they're the children of Warhol, Kuhns, Basquiat, Hearst, Prince, Takashi Murakami, you know, on his Japanese trip, say. The rest are all reassuringly Chinese. Now, let me juxtapose that with another table drawn by James Elkins. Um, is art history global, he asks. And he tries to answer by studying database analysis, looking at citations of artists. And what, you know, what do you expect? Uh, you know, the canon is small, full of dead white guys, and concentrated. You know, only a small number of artists have a, have a density of attribution. So, you know, cited five times, it goes from 10,000 to cited once to 700 cited five times. Now this, was, this book was 2007. In the same book that I took the first chart from, this is Jonathan Harris uh, edited catalog, um, publication that came out in 2011. Elkins has answered his question. No longer is there a question mark on is art history global, uh, but, but his, his contribution to this is why art history is global. And he argues uh, again through, through this sort of notion of, uh, of citation by picking on what he thinks is the preeminent example, uh, Gita Kapoor, who he talks as, on, yes, I mean, you can read what it says, but I mean, in a nutshell, what he's saying is Gita Kapoor's analysis uh, and, and uh, lucidity and, er, is, is the best that he's seen, but it's irrelevant because nobody's citing it. It's not reflected in Latin America. It's not reflected in the syllabuses uh, of, of the colleges that he's teaching. So if it cannot be improved, but who cares? The West has won. Uh, so this is, um, it's a sort of art history as, as accounting, no? Um, and, um, and we could sort of, I don't think we have the time here right now, but we could run into a little other tangent of the, the father of accounting, Luca Pacchioli in the 15th century, also taught Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and if you think about the, the father of art history, 
and his focus, Giorgio Vasari, and his, his focus on Leonardo da Vinci, that perhaps a bit of this accounting carried on uh, into the art history profession. But let's stop levity aside. I think what it, what it does is it just points to art history's limitations, I think. I think we're asking it too much. We're asking art history to help us with what is contemporary art. Uh, and I don't think it can do that. Uh, but uh, perhaps what the questions that we need to ask is what does contemporary art do and to whom? Where does it live? And for this, I would argue we need other fields of thought. Let me go back to Basecamp. So art is education, it's community, it's enriching, it's capacity building, it's history, and it's all of these things that Mela says it is. And as I was sort of reading through this in our Field Notes uh, journal, I was struck by how the language, and in terms of what, what we're asking art to do, was similar to this. The study of human beings as to how they coordinate their wants and desires. So this is the fundamental definition of economics. Another discipline that is struggling to figure out what it is that it's supposed to be doing. And I actually, I mean, I, I, this is not to make a flippant point. I think this conflation with economics is very productive. Because uh, I think demand, supply, utility, institutions, comparative advantage, human behavior, competition, barriers to entry, market segmentation, I think these are the terms and concepts that are shaping the art world. And the problem that we've, we have of people working within the art world and its institutions is that we, we've chosen not to engage with it. And to engage with it does not mean that we accept it on its terms, but I think to engage with it means, um, and I, I think that the best uh, metaphor I can come up with, sorry I don't have an image, is that of pushing hands. So which is a, an extension of Tai Chi, where you're playing with people and, you, and you're trying to you know, use each other's energy to knock somebody off balance. I think we have to push hands with the market with economics, to understand what it does, what its energies are, so that we can use it for our own means. Because actually the, uh, the relationship of uh, economics and the arts goes way back. Uh, going back to my sort of uh, home, if you like, of London, John Maynard Keynes, that eminent economist, perhaps the eminent economist of the 20th century, uh, father of many things, including the United Nations, also fathered a bastard child, which was called the uh, Arts Council of Great Britain. He was the founding chairman. And in its founding vision, uh, what he uh, laid out was, art is what will address the poverty of aspiration. So the Arts Council of Great Britain was part of the welfare state of, of the British nation. And somewhere along the line, we've forgotten that connection. Let's move on for a second excursion through Marxist history. At the turn of this century, uh, the late Marxist historian Eric uh, Hobsbawm published a carefully worded but withering analysis of visual arts underachievement in the 20th century. In his Behind the Times, The Decline and Fall of the 20th Century Avant-Garde, he diagnosed two challenges that visual, arts, uh, visual artists have failed to meet. The first of these, you, would be, you wouldn't be surprised to know, was economic. He said that visual artists haven't sorted out their business model. You know, they have an inability to cope with reproduction. Why is there an art market that deals in singular objects? Why are there art museums? Why are there no museums for books? His second challenge to visual arts was off technology. And the comparison he was making with, with, with film said was where film has opened up new ways for us to see, visual arts have been overwhelmed by technological progress. And so this was pre-internet. So he, uh, 
So we can sort of gloss over some of this as the whingings of an old Marxist. But I think what he was aiming at, uh, we still haven't quite reached the after, even for uh, contemporary art. The market has tried to make mediums do unnatural acts. So photography and video is, lim is sold in limited editions. Performances are captured and being museumified uh, and domesticated. But these are sort of economic solutions to an intractable problem. Artists have been seeking new forms to try and escape this problem, most obviously towards film. And, you know, sort of, of course, we know Steve McQueen and Apichat Pong, but this has been going on for some time. Emma Fossein got the silver bear uh, in, in Berlin in the 60s. Julian Schlabel in New York. But that the film is obvious one. There's also this new uh, intensity of engagement with the social, or what Nathan Thompson uh, has termed living as form. Uh, and we saw some of these initiatives uh, in Jung Yang's presentation yesterday. But, the, but how these accounts uh, deal with the label of art is what we're still left grappling with. And do they actually need this label of art? And I give, give you an, uh, share with you an anecdote by, uh, of Wong Hoi Chong, the accomplished Malaysian artist, who right now is in the kitchen cabinet of Malaysia's main opposition party. Uh, he is preparing for elections, designing campaign strategies, uh, schemes for urbanization and participa participatory democracy, and is categorical that what he's doing is politics. That's not art. I want to, I'm going to wrap up here, and maybe this will be uh, the last of my excursions, and we can save the rest for later. Um, uh, this is, uh, I want to propose that contemporary art has reached its high noon phase. And although the Gary Cooper, Grace Kelly film is an interesting example about, you know, and the shootout, it's like this is not the high noon I'm referring to. It's the high noon from quantum physics. It's what happens when a photon is accelerated to vast speeds so that it can take two different parts at once. Uh, and of course, the issue with accelerating a photon to these kinds of speeds is you need the right kinds of institutions. You need the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. I don't think contemporary art has built its Large Hadron Collider. Charles just walked us through some of the institutions that are being built right now in the world. I don't think you're going to be able to see any of these photons and the different parts that they, uh, that they travel around in those institutions. Uh, I'm going to conclude now, actually, with, uh, with one, one uh, sort of, I think, hopeful uh, thought and then a work of art. In, in his book, Together, The Rituals, Pleasures, and Politics of Cooperation, the social scientist Richard Sennett proposes that living with people who differ racially, ethnically, religiously, and economically is the most urgent challenge, challenge facing civil society today. And I would argue that for this, we need to equip ourselves with tools to perceive ourselves and others. Art has these tools of imagination, of curiosity, of humor. And it is for this reason that while there is a huge exodus of disillusioned artists abandoning art for activism, they're crossing a huge crowd of people, architects like Zaha Hadid among first among them, who want to get to what art has to offer. So activists, architects, art historians, cultural theorists, criminologists, filmmakers, philosophers, psychotherapists, sociologists even, are being drawn into the undisciplined discipline of art because it can help them think through intractable problems in their own field. But let's end, let's end with art. This is a piece by Emily Jassier, the, the, um, the artist who actually, Charles, now describes herself as living around the Mediterranean. It's a piece called Sexy Semite. It was made, uh, it was a collaborative intervention. Um, uh, she asked a circle of Palestinian friends living in New York to place personal ads in the Village Voice newspaper. 
seeking Jewish mates for marriage as a means of returning home, utilizing Israel's law of return, which is applicable only to Jews. I only have this image, but the favorite, but a favorite ad I'll just read out to you. It says, you stole the land, may as well take the women. Redhead Palestinian, ready to be colonized by your army. You, Jewish, hot, strong, you take me home, and I'll let you win. The ads peppered the public realm over a period of three years. Um, their number and reach over time serving to amplify their impact. Uh, and in a post-September 11 New York, uh, you know, consumed by terrorism and security concerns, a number of American publications, including the New York po Post, were alarmed by the subversive nature of these ads, ascribing kidnapping or other terrorist motives to those who placed the ads. Everything, in fact, but for seeing this campaign as the conceptually subtle, politically provocative piece of art that it was. Thank you. <laughs>